Hello again everyone and welcome back to the channel. It's time for another YYT Deck Tech Talk with Steve D. And today we're going to be talking about Water Ice and what I think has changed for Water Ice Vice Kings going into Opus 9. So this is a build that yesterday I took to 5-0 at Locals and I really enjoy the way the deck plays out. But before I go into too many details, time for a little bit of a history lesson. Back in Opus 1 and up the way till about Opus 4, I don't think there was any real reason to play Water Ice. There were no win conditions, there was no majorly powerful strategy, and occasionally there was a sort of a fringe deck came up with uh, Legend Ultimecia from Opus 1, but I don't think it was particularly powerful or potent. And even in Opus 4, when much of the monster support that was new at the time came out uh, in Water and Ice, that didn't really break it out to be any kind of a major tier deck. It wasn't until Opus 6 that two of the most ridiculously powerful on-entry abilities were printed into Water Ice that happened to have a very cool synergy with each other, that we ended up getting a completely new archetype born that has been quite powerful since, but I think got an awful lot this Opus. So the two cards I think that were most pivotal to this archetype making any sense at all were Layla, who is not much of a stranger to most people. Layla is such a tremendous value engine, just hit touching the field gives you two bodies almost all of the time, and even though those bodies are not very impressive, your opponent is still going to bleed out at the same rate, uh, unless they do something major and dro start dropping blockers prematurely, or start spending removal even just on small things, otherwise they're going to take this huge amount of damage. And the other powerful on-entry ability printed in Opus 6 was Legend Renoa. Legend Renoa effectively lets you copy any of your other abilities on entry. Sure, there's a little bit more to it than that, but Renoa uh, has got this little bit of a Hearthstone Shudderwalk thing going on of being able to duplicate any of the on entry abilities that you find powerful or interesting in your deck. So rounding out this package, you've got to play some Vikings along with Layla, and these two, I guess in, in strange situations when you're playing against Heavy Discard, it actually makes sense for you to Renoa your Vikings to just draw two cards, but for the most part, Renoa and Layla together represent tremendous value and it's very difficult for your opponent to aggro you out when you've got the power of being able to draw and summon these chump blockers until you've set up and then your kind of control game kicks in. So I think the Renoa and Layla are always going to be very good and always enjoy each other's company. And now a couple of the more historic cards that I'll just get out of the way first. Because this deck goes wide very very easily with Layla, Viking, Renoa, I'm playing three copies of Cloud of Darkness because it gives some much needed removal, again, on entry ability, so if you really want to, you could Renoa on Cloud of Darkness to duplicate that ability. But yeah, I don't think there's much hard removal, certainly not much targeted removal in ice or in water, so the fact that there's some of it printed on this ridiculously decently statted body as well, it's just icing on the cake. And the very last card that I think the on entry ability is the main talking point is Legend Sephiroth. I think that these five playsets have been effectively the core of Water Ice since about Opus 7, so there's not really too much there that there's not much more readily available information on, but yeah, I, I think that with all of these you've got access to a wide variety of strategies. If your opponent is being a control deck and you suspect that they have a better late game than you, then gunning them down with aggro Layla Viking plays is smart. Alternatively, the sort of mid-range games get completely torn about torn apart sorry by cloud of darkness and then again if your opponent's got a big setup deck or is trying to set up something ambitious like mono water then discard two and often discard four when played alongside each other is completely backbreaking. Enough of the history lesson and it's time to talk about some of my new favorite cards from this opus. I think the card that stood out most to me at the very end of spoiler season was ghost. Ghost is perfectly unusual and when I first saw it I thought oh that's cool it turns any category six forward into Layla Viking, effectively. You play a body, lots of which are quite cheap, and then all of a sudden you've got the option, once you've set up and once your economy is there, you can optionally overpay to get back Ghost as well. And again, just like Layla Viking, it doesn't matter that the body is not especially big, that body can do an awful lot of things like doing your opponent player point damage, it can be sacrificed to Famfruit or Veritas if your opponent or yourself ends up playing those kind of a things, and I think generally it's, it's wonderful to have these kind of options as well. Like, effectively there's now an optional two mana kicker cost on all of your category 6 forwards to be able to summon a ghost as well and that gives you wonderful options and again anything that helps you go wide is very good for cloud of darkness so it seemed like a, a natural thing to maybe want to try in a deck like this so i ended up settling on the following support for ghost i absolutely had to play my favorite card of all time in lock Locke is handy when you're playing the aggro game alongside Layla Viking, because not only is he going to do damage very quickly because he's cheap, you know, you can throw him out on turn two off of one backup and not really regret it all that much, because your opponent effectively has to answer it there and then. 
but he's also very good alongside Sephiroth for being able to attack first, take the last one card out of your opponent's hand if they've been trying to play around the Shadow Flare, and then Sephiroth gets a dull and freeze off, and typically you've won from that point. Lock is further supplemented by Strago. Unfortunately, there is a little bit of anti-synergy between Lock and Ghost. Locks on entry ability is what is classed as a conditional auto ability, meaning that you need to have two or more other category six characters as Lock enters the field. You can't just say, I'll play Lock, I'll summon Ghost, Ghost being your second character, and then get the discard. You need to have those two characters as Lock's ability goes onto the stack and also as the ability resolves. So you don't get uh, a discard by one category six backup, for instance, and then playing Lock and summoning Ghost. However, you do get the effect from Strago, and Strago was a card that I think has gotten substantially more powerful with the printing of Ghost because of this. Strago's ability only checks if you have another Category 6 forward as the ability resolves, meaning you could even play Strago onto an empty field, get these two bodies, and bounce something back to your opponent's hand. A little bit about Bounce in general. I think that Bounce is quite weak when played as a summon. I don't think you'll see many Leviathans unless it's the Leviathan again from Opus 6. Uh, because it's a little bit more of a multitasking tool. Bouncing your opponent's things back to hand is quite weak when on-entry abilities are so strong, and there's a lot of very strong on-entry abilities, which is the entire premise of this deck. But equally, I would say that there's a lot of things that don't have on-entry abilities that are quite prominent in the meta, such as Yushtola from Opus 5. Noctis is quite prominent as well. There's a lot of on-entry abilities that are definitely not worth the cost of the forward, like the new Magis Sisters. And there's also a lot of on-entry auto abilities that are quite expensive if you have to do if you have to pay the forward a couple of times in a row, like the new Vincent. So I think there's enough things in the meta that bouncing is good. And while that isn't really good enough for me to want to dedicate a summon slot to playing bounce cards, I think that Strago coming again with this kind of a token body, and a token body that sometimes counts towards locks categories and deals damage and, and can occasionally be flickered, there's enough little small upsides that I really want to play Strago, and Strago again being able to summon Ghost back onto the field is quite powerful. Four more forwards in the deck, I'm playing three copies of Porom because frankly who isn't just now? Porom is a disgustingly good card because of a few degenerate interactions in particular, but even worst case scenario. She's pretty much always going to be a, a zero mana small forward, and in case you can't tell, I like small forwards. They're good in this deck. The very last forward I'm playing is one copy of Legend Kuja. I don't really think there's room for Genesis in this deck. If I was playing Genesis, it would definitely be at the expense of the Category 6 engine, because it's quite greedy for space, but very powerful. Don't knock it until you give it a try. And also, I know that historically, Vice King's lists, because there's a lot of standard unit support and you're, you're playing Brani for Viking anyway, there is very little overhead to adding some other standard unit forwards like the Time Mage or the Black Mage that can draw two cards and discard one on entry. Those are all perfectly fine. Uh, I don't mind them at all, but I think it would cut into the density of either a lot of our big win conditions or a lot of our small Category 6 things that fuel Ghost. Your choice, player preference. I'm going to go over the backups now. This deck is quite remarkable or unusual because I'm only playing two backups that cost two. It's something that it took me a long time to get over as a player. I used to think that the game was entirely solved if you could play two two-cost backups on turn one, and then any kind of a four-cost play or another two-cost backup on turn two, and kind of follow on from that. That is much less the case now, and I'm much more okay with playing any kind of backup, even if it looks like you're overpaying for it on turn one, so long as that backup takes you to a better place and sets you up quite far. So. Uh, if you're if you like are like my past self and always find yourself overdosing on two CP backups, then give this a try because it might be a good little confidence builder for you as well. There's three copies of Bran, Branny, everybody's favourite granny in this deck, mostly because Viking is so important. Branny makes a lot of other cards live, so you can even play the Viking on turn two if you're drawing completely dead and not finding more backups because drawing a, a card or two cards over, the, over Viking's lifetime is very powerful. But also, as soon as you know where one of your Vikings is, either in your hand or in your break zone, then all of your Laylas become live and they're not just a ridiculously overcosted 3k. So playing Branny at the earliest opportunity, never discard one until you've played one, I would say is pretty much mandatory advice. And another backup that looks like you're overpaying for it on turn one, but really it's fine in the long run, is Castalian Empire Sid. There's not tons of Category 6 cards here, but the ones that are here are quite powerful, and they come online very quickly in games. You will often want to search out Lock, because pressure from Lock is a great way to make your opponent crumble to what you're trying to do, and make your opponent deviate from their own plan to try and answer yours, and that's always good. But 
You can also search out Ghost if you either have drawn Lock naturally or just want something that you're happy to discard early on, safe in the knowledge that it's going to come back later when you start to play your more important cards. I'm also playing as another pseudo two cost backup, three copies of Setzer. I think there's just about enough category six forwards that by the time you want to play sets or you know turn turn two maybe turn three there will almost certainly be something drawn so that you can get value out of sets and as my other range of backups that are pseudo two costs i'm playing mirror loop draw two discard one on entry it's a very helpful ex i don't actually have any dark cards or light cards in this deck mostly because i didn't think any were really powerful enough I suppose in a, a weird kind of universe you could maybe play one copy of the Light Terror from Opus 4 because there's, there's a couple of really neat little interactions that I'll go over later and it's another Category 6 forward for Ghost's sake but I think that Merylwood is really just good for finding you more backups. Because this list is playing a lot of named backups and not a lot of standard unit kind of backups then you have got the, maybe not a risk but Certainly there's the chance that you could draw into a couple of your Gustalian Empire Sids, and if those had been two differently named backups, then that would be a perfectly keepable hand, but now you don't know because you, you're really only holding one playable backup. Merylweb is very good at digging you out of those situations and finding you more live cards, and this deck has got an abundance of cards you're quite happy to discard early on, like your Ghosts, like basically anything that's retrievable. Your Summons are all retrievable because of Porum. Uh, Kuja is retrievable by sacking backups later on and maybe you can then replay some more named backups of Ice Element. So there's a lot of things you can discard with Merylweb and not feel too bad about it in exchange for refreshing your hand. That's quite powerful. I'm playing one copy of Leonora because again she's a pseudo 2 CP backup and searches out Porum who becomes very very useful once your opponent is in a state of being able to attack. The only two cost backup I'm playing is two copies of Yuna. Uh, we'll go over why later on but She's uh, been basically a format staple since Opus 1, and it cheapens all water summons you cast by 1 CP, which is great. And the last of the backups, one copy of Snow. When you go into Swarm mode, Snow feels like the best card you could possibly draw. I'm not playing more copies because, uh, unlike a lot of the backups in this deck, it actually does cost you 4 CP, it doesn't draw you a card, doesn't search you a card, so it feels very clunky if you're forced to play that in the early stage of the game. And you wouldn't play two copies or like the chance of you getting that backup blown up and that is why you lose is exceptionally low so I'm, I'm quite happy to just play it when I see it but I don't want to draw them too early because they suck to have to play early on and they, they tend not to do too much until the later stage of the game anyway which is when you'll probably draw your one copy I, I really have never struggled by playing only one copy but I, likewise I don't think I would go down to zero because it's very powerful when you start to go really white lastly one devout I think Devout 2 is quite slow these days. Uh, 4 CP is a lot to pay for a backup that doesn't have a continuous ability and can only be used once and, and you're only going to want to crack it in the late game. So until you break it, you're operating on a bit of a CP deficit. But in any deck playing Renoa, when Renoa is a bad card, she is terrible. She's a 7 for 4 with no abilities and you'll just want to discard her to play something else. But when Renoa is good, she's the best card in the game and it's for those situations that Devout helps you find your Renoas that you drew too early. Like, when your opponent has four cards in hand and you can do three backups, discard two, play Sephiroth, crack it about, Renoa on Sephiroth, take away their whole hand, you've just won the game. Like, Renoa onto quite a few things can bring you back from the rink of death, or can checkmate your opponent turns and turns earlier than you should have been able to otherwise. So it's for those situations that I really recommend one devout in deck playing Renoa, because she's such a variable card to draw at different times. Moving on to the summons, I'm playing three copies of Famfrit, and it's the only summon that's at three in this list. Famfrit previously was uh, probably still a three of in most Vice Gang's list throughout Opus 8 that I saw, because it's very powerful when your board is much wider than your opponent's, and when you've got removal to snipe down your opponent's small things, and then they have to sacrifice something big to Famfrit. Famfrit got a lot better though with the printing of Porum, and I'm sure everyone's heard of this combo by now, but even if you don't have another Famfrit in Grave, you can cast your first Famfrit, sacrifice Porum, when Porum dies, get back the Famfrit that you just played. It's uh, it's degenerate, and because of this, because of this interaction in particular, instead of casting Famfrit two, maybe three times per game, I can actually see myself casting it four or five times per game. I think my record was six yesterday when I, I took this deck to 5-0, and Famfrit being castable that many more times now is why I've opted for two copies of Yuna. Again, she shows up just about often enough. You often don't Famfrit too early, or if you are Famfriting early, it's because your opponent has played something terribly aggressive and you don't mind paying three if it digs you out of that scenario. 
Two copies of Glacia. I think it's good, but I think a lot of the forwards with very powerful on-entry abilities are better, so I've kind of skimped on summons just to fit in more good dudes. Uh, Glazia is very good at making your aggro opponents run out of steam and is very good at pushing for lethal as well. Occasionally you can use it to dull something and take the last card out of your opponent's hand to enable Sephiroth, so bear that in mind. And the last summon I'm playing is two copies of the new Zolera that's very very powerful. Zolera is one of the reasons that I really considered playing one copy of Light Terra in this deck, because paying four for Terra and then one for Zolera that you fetch from deck being able to break a 5 cost or a 3 cost like that, it almost feels like you've built your own Legend Cecil from Earth, except it's playable in a deck that doesn't normally have access to that kind or that calibre of removal. So, seems powerful, Zalera is very good at getting rid of problematic things, a really irritating card for this deck to come up against is Noctis. Noctis has that triggered ability that people hopefully know by now, whenever they take damage they can snipe one of your, your smaller forwards using Noctis, and that is really obnoxious. So something that gets a clean break on Noctis for quite cheap, the only prerequisite being that he's dull, is very handy for you. And apart from that, it's a few problematic things like a clean break on Aerith, uh, it's good against Yustola. Basically, any time you can kill a 5 cost with this, you're massively, massively ahead. So uh, yeah, it's, it's good enough for two slots, but I don't think I would play three because it doesn't really do anything until your opponent has got forwards that they have in all likelihood attacked you with. And that usually doesn't come around until turn 4 or maybe turn 5 of a game. So that is my take on V Ice Kings. I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear your builds and how you've chosen to put some variations on this. There is a deck list in the description. And as always, we really appreciate your likes, your comments and your subscribes. Thank you very much.